21, and I'm going to read verses 33 to 46, and this will be our final message on the parable of the wicked tenants. We looked at the parable itself last week. This morning we looked at uh, <clears throat> much of Christ's application. We're going to wrap up his application, and then we're going to make some of our own application to modern times to the church today. But I'll, be, I'll read 33 to 46. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower. We're going to start again. This thing was playing. It wasn't recording. It was actually playing the last sermon. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> Matthew. We need to replace this thing if John's not here. Here we go. Forget it. I give up. I give up. Matthew 21. Sorry. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 21. Our topic, the parable of the wicked tenants. And I'm going to read verses 33 to 46. This is the third message in the parable of the wicked tenants. <laughs> Last week we looked at the uh, parable itself and the context and some introductory considerations. Uh, today, we look uh, a whole bunch this morning at Jesus' application, which is exceptionally strong and pointed. We're going to finish his application this afternoon, and then we're going to make our own applications for modern times directed at the modern church and so on. <clears throat> Starting at verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say, I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And here's where we're going to begin this afternoon, verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. The sin of the reading of God's holy word. We just finished looking at Jesus pointedly telling the leaders of Israel that the covenant privilege that the Jews had had for many, many centuries will be removed from them, taken away from them because of their wickedness in persecuting the prophets, their unbelief, and, and even murdering the Messiah, and then persecuting the apostles and their prophets, his prophets, it will be removed from them and be given to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. And that, of course, is the New Covenant Church, which is both Jew and Gentile. It's multinational, Ephesians chapter 2. The one temple of God. And then he turns and gives them a further warning in verse 44, which ties in beautifully to verse 42. 
he returns to the stone imagery as a personal warning to his listeners. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. <clears throat> Here our Lord builds upon the messianic stone language of Psalm 118, verse 22, by alluding to prophecies of judgment from Isaiah and Daniel. The first clause is based on imagery taken from Isaiah 8, 14 to 15, where the wicked Jews stumble over God as a stone. They will stumble and fall and be broken. Jesus applies this imagery to himself, and thus he puts himself on the same level as Jehovah. No prophet could do this. Only Christ could do this because he was indeed God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Christ was a stumbling block to the Jewish leaders and their followers with the result of total destruction. Now Peter combines this Jewish, uh, this Isaiah passage imagery <clears throat> with Psalm 118.22 to describe those who rejected the gospel concluding and this is from 1 Peter 2.8. They stumbled, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. <clears throat> Those who oppose Christ are going to fall flat on their faces. Their opposition results in their own destruction. Now, a lot of people will, uh, some commentators will look at this and they'll say, well, in this first clause, he's talking about getting, you, you stumble over Christ, you get bruised, you get beaten up. Well, that's not what's being taught in the Isaiah passage. <clears throat> in Isaiah 8.15, the verb, be broken, indicates complete destruction. And the Septuagint translated as, be smashed. Those who stumble at the, the Messiah are going to be smashed. They're going to fall and they're going to be smashed. They're going to be destroyed. The second clause alludes to Daniel chapter 2 where the Messianic kingdom is represented as a stone that struck the image, which represented all the kingdoms of the world, and obliterates them, verses 34, 35 and 44. And it grows to fill the whole earth. The exalted Messiah is going to conquer all those who oppose him. And he's going to rule the entire earth. The passage is very clear. When the stone hits the statue, and as you remember, it represents Rome, Babylon, the Medes and Persians, and so forth, it crushes it so thoroughly that, and this is verse 35 from Daniel, chapter 2, it became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. So the idea here is extremely strong. Our Lord will not only crush his opponents, but also scatter them into nothingness. Jesus is warning his hearers, anyone who opposes me is going to be pulverized. And these judgment passages fit beautifully with Psalm 118, 22 and following. For the destruction of the wicked is the flip side to messianic victory. Those who oppose the exalted Son of God are going to be pounded into atoms. They're going to be blown into oblivion. This is the most uh, vivid destruction language one could imagine being applied to the enemies of Christ. They end up in the ash heap of all human history. And all of this calls to mind a messianic psalm of victory and warning, which says this. This is Psalm 2, 6 to 12. Psalm 2, 6 to 12. Which teaches much the same thing. I have set my king. This is God the Father talking. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. 
Today I have begotten you. That's referring to the resurrection. <clears throat> Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Now throughout this verse, in Matthew 21, Jesus is using singulars as he's warning individual hearers to reject what their leaders are doing and repent before it's too late. <clears throat> the sin of unbelief leads the people of Israel to oppose Christ and his cause. And such opposition leads to <clears throat> the Savior's severe wrath which will be executed on many in this life and on every unbeliever in the in the final judgment. On that day they will not stand. They'll be cut down like grass. The results of opposing God's beloved and only Son are a just wrath that is overwhelming, fatal, eternal, and irretrievable. That's what Jesus is saying here. If you oppose Him, He will most certainly crush you and grind you to powder. So this, this attitude, well, <laughs> yeah, the Bible talks about Jesus, and I've heard the gospel. It's no big deal. I, you know, I'm just not interested. Well, Jesus tells you right to your face what's going to happen to you. <clears throat> this is your end. Total destruction. And then after this, we get the reaction of the leaders. After the parable comes to an end, and Jesus' application, of course, comes to an end, Matthew tells us the reaction of these leaders. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Verses 45 and 46. Now, the parables mentioned would include at least the parable of the two sons and this parable. <clears throat> Whether there were others, we don't know. But these are included. Here the elders mentioned in verse 23 are identified as Pharisees. Matthew, writing from a Jewish perspective, wants his audience to understand that the two main parties that made up the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, are united in their desire to arrest and murder Jesus. Now if this was written today about America, he would say the Democrats and the Republicans. Same thing. They were the two main parties that. <clears throat> The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the people and were highly respected by the masses. They were popular. The priests belonged to the Sadducees who ran the temple complex and they held the top positions of political power in the nation. The high priest was essentially the ruler of Israel. The Pharisees and Sadducees had strong differences among themselves. In that day, the Pharisees would have been considered the conservatives, and the Sadducees would have been considered the liberals. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels and so forth. They were the liberals of their day. However, when it, they were in complete agreement in their hatred and opposition to Christ, and they agreed, this man has to be put to death for the sake of the nation, for the sake of our position. Their hardness of heart and hopelessness can be seen in their reaction to our Lord's doctrine. Instead of this brilliant, penetrating teaching bringing conviction and repentance, what happens? They get angry. It brings strong anger. Their desire to arrest and murder Jesus is strengthened by this teacher. Matthew is showing us their culpability. Uh, by the way, the, the, the first verse is only included in Matthew. The, the verse about the fear of the people is included in all three synoptic gospels. They had a fear of of the, cr the crowds. <clears throat> the Savior warned them to, uh, to their face what would happen to them and their followers if they continued on their present course of unbelief and rebellion. And their reaction was a plan to permanently shut Jesus' mouth. 
not one iota of conviction, not one iota of repentance. And they understood perfectly what Jesus was saying. They understood exactly what he was teaching, that it applied to them. Didn't affect them at all. They were so infuriated by this teaching that they would have arrested our Lord at once if they had that, uh, they would have arrested him on the spot. But they were restrained by the fear of the people who believed that Jesus was a prophet. The statement, of course, reminds us of verse 26, where they could not give an answer regarding John the Baptist because they feared the people, they feared the multitude, because of what they thought about John the Baptist. They regarded him as a prophet also. They remembered the hosannas shouted by the people when he entered Jerusalem. And the popularity he enjoyed as a result of the many miracles. You've got to keep in mind, if you look at this in line with John's gospel, Lazarus had just been risen, raised from the dead. This was all over the place. People knew about the, the fact that Lazarus had been dead and now he was alive. God used their, this fear to restrain their hand for the Savior's time to die had not yet come. It was a few days away, but it had not yet come. He wanted him to die on Friday. He wanted him to be in the tomb on Saturday and rise on Sunday. Now, if one takes the Hosannas and this statement and combine, combine it <clears throat> with the fact that many of the Jews in Jerusalem would be crying out for Christ's crucifixion in a few days, one must conclude that the multitude's views about Jesus were superficial and not rooted in deep thought or sincere belief. Yeah, he's some kind of prophet. He might be the Messiah. But they were easily swayed by the, their leaders to shout for the release of Barabbas instead of Christ. It is interesting that our Lord's own teaching on unbelief, unfaithfulness, and the coming judgment upon the Jewish <coughs> leaders of the nation escalates the confrontation with the leaders and contributes to the very events prophesied makes them even angry. Now, they've they planned this for years. You, you go back to the first incidents in the temple when he overturned the money tables and so forth. They've been planning since then to get rid of Jesus. The parable of the wicked tenants inflamed their hatred and rage even more than the story of the two sons. Well, let's look at further applications here. The parable of the wicked tenants is exceptionally rich in doctrine and lessons for present-day Christians. And there are a number of things that we ought to learn from the story and our Lord's own application. First, <clears throat> there is an amazing and infinitely high view of Christ presented here. <clears throat> Jesus claims about himself in the parable and in his application of the parable are exceptional. He is not simply a prophet, but God's only son, who is beloved by God, if you combine the three synoptic Gospels. Now the Jewish leaders understood what Jesus was saying. They understood his claim, for they, they would accuse him of blasphemy for making himself equal to God at the trial. And of course he presents himself as the finality of revelation, coming after the prophets. There are many people who think they are honoring Christ by speaking of him as a great prophet, a wonderful teacher, or even as the uh, last and best of the prophets. But such thinking completely misrepresents who Jesus really was. It dishonors him. And it, it is heretical. It is heretical to just talk of him as a great teacher or another prophet. Christ is the Son of God, who is eternally begotten of the Father. As John so eloquently puts it in his Gospel, John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. <clears throat> now in Islam, 
Jesus is presented as a, a, a great prophet, one of the best. But the greatest of prophets, of course, is Muhammad, who we know, as Christians, we know was a liar, a false prophet, and a child molester, among other things, and a murderer. The Jews, to this day, regard Jesus as a, as a magician, as an imposter, as a false prophet. In addition, Christ takes Old Testament passages about Jehovah and he applies them to himself. He takes prophecies where the word Yahweh or Jehovah is used and he applies them directly to himself. No prophet would ever do that. No true prophet would ever do that. He is the messianic king who rules over all and judges disobedient nations. He is the stone that snatches all pagan kingdoms and rules the entire earth with a rod of iron. If his claims were unfounded, he would have been a heretical madman and a blasphemer who deserved to die. But his claims were indeed true. And they have been demonstrated to be true by his glorious resurrection. The resurrection was God the Father's stamp of approval on the ministry of Christ of what he accomplished. He came to this earth to obey the Father's will, and he did it in exhaustive detail to the bitter end of suffering. Jesus deserves to be worshipped and reverenced by all mankind because of who he is and what he has accomplished. <clears throat> he is the cornerstone of salvation and the foundation of all godly rule. say, so well, what's the problem with the United States? Well, the problem is, is that we don't look to Christ. Our leaders don't look to Christ. They don't bow the knee to Him. The all-important question for everyone is, what do you think of Jesus? If you do not answer, the Messiah, the Son of God, the only Savior of mankind, you will suffer the same fate as the Jewish leaders. If you do not look to Christ as the Christ, as the Messiah, who fulfilled prophecy, as Jehovah, the second person of the Trinity, who came to earth in the incarnation, was born in Bethlehem, and died on the cross for the sins of his people. If you don't look to Christ as that, you cannot be saved. You are doomed. The Bible is crystal clear about that. Second, <clears throat> this portion of Scripture teaches us the critical importance of good leadership in the religious and political realms. The leaders of Israel were given this privileged position by God. They were placed there by God. And they were given great responsibilities. But they became corrupt. And they were more interested in their power, popularity, and prestige than in following Scripture. They had divine revelation. They had God's glorious law. They had the covenants. They had the oracles of God where the rest of the world was in darkness. People stumbling around with pagan law orders, stumbling around in the darkness worshiping idols. But they had the truth. 